For a while now, I've been wanting something new from Capcom. They have long lasting franchises we've all become fans of over the years, but sometimes you want to see something different from them and not just rely on the small handful of titles that definitely had their time to shine. And come on now, those all time classics are highly regarded because they tried something new for the era. We know the development stories by now, but that sort of lightning in a bottle creativity of the past is sorely missed. But when they announced an upcoming game based on a brand new IP with gameplay very different, yeah, I knew this was something to watch out for. This is Combat Overview. Here we go over the general controls, the main mechanics, who or what we use them on, and then seeing how it all comes together. We have our basic combo that loops into itself, no directional attacks or delays, but it gets the job done. We do have a heavy or dance attack as it's called here, just the one move, but there's different enders depending on when you chain between the two. Starting with this rising attack, it's not a launcher, but it's to hit tall or flying enemies. Then this up close swipes to crowd control. And lastly, a little combo that moves forward, which can help clear a row of lesser enemies. There's also a second fighting style you can unlock, but I didn't use it too much. Nothing bad with it or anything like that, just really got used to the one we started out with. Would have been interesting if we could swap between these stances on the fly. Maybe in a sequel? Fingers crossed. There's also a bow to unlock, including different shot types. One appears through a crowd, one to teleport to whatever you hit, a timed explosive, one to slow a small crowd, or one to deal solid damage to a single target. They're not limited to a resource, but you can only equip one shot type at a time. So depending on how you want to play around certain enemies or groupings, we get to use this pretty cool sub weapon to help out with that. On to defenses, let's start with our guard. You can move around, It'll snap you to whatever tries to attack you, and you won't take any chip damage. But with each attack you block, it'll destroy your guard gauge, which is that yellow meter. And once broken, we'll be stunned, leaving yourself wide open for a massive hit. So to manage it, just need to drop your guard to let it recharge on its own. And guarding again will only slow that process down. So use it sparingly. Now we also have a counter similar to Ninja Gaiden. So while guarding, you can attack as soon as an enemy makes contact with your block to do this counter attack. You'll still take some guard damage, but it's great to use against a single enemy. And that's because there's no iframes. So it's not the best when surrounded. Wouldn't you guess it, there's guard cancels too. I'll use this to either get rid of those villain enemies to maintain the size of the crowd, or to quickly get rid of those problem targets in short time, since the end lag on enders might be too risky. And it'll let us perfect guard on reaction too. So perfect blocks won't eat at our meter, we'll stagger that attacking enemy, and sends out this burst to knock back that nearby crowd. It's pretty strict to do, so I wouldn't try this on every single attack in the game, but hey, at least you're rewarded for doing this more demanding defensive option with some iframes. Now these options around our guard won't be all because there's unblockable attacks shown by the red warning sign. The only way to avoid these is with your dodge. No perfect timed ones, but you can cancel into it at any moment, which is really handy. It's just a tried and true dodge with solid amount of iframes, and end lag afterwards to prevent mashing, so use it wisely. Now wild thing is, it's done by clicking in the left thumbstick. I didn't check till now when typing this up, but you can remap your buttons if it's too uncomfortable, but I like how different it is. It made me put some real thought or effort into dodging for once, like on a tactile level if that makes any sense. But yeah, everything is pretty damn useful and have their role to play. The defensive game isn't centralized around one option, so use them all. Looking at the HUD, our health is shown as this banner and the guard gauge which we went over already. Now top left is our Suba guards, their cooldown based skills. Can only equip one at first, then with later upgrades can equip up to three to freely swap between. There's a decent amount of them, but to save some time, here are my favorites. Tuzaku's flame, which is the sweep dealing solid damage. I like to use it on those larger problem enemies. Cochin's ward puts down the stationary dome it actually has enemies bounce right off so they can't walk through it, so it can help in a pinch when you need to really protect the maiden. And Seiryu's Gale is this high reaching multi hit that will just shred bosses resist gauge. Will completely whiff anything below, but when used right, it's pretty good. To refill these, just need to wait them out. Thing is, only the main one that's currently picked gets to recharge. Interesting, so this prevents players from cheesing fights just by rotating through all those cooldowns hassle-free throughout the entire fight. Makes these more of a limited thing, 
and not meant to be used all the time. For some equipables, there's talismans, which are little passives. From standard stuff like increasing your defense, your damage, your health. But there's ones to buff your villagers in specific ways. Lower the cost to change roles, make perfect guard a bit easier, one to run faster, or shorten downtime on skills, speed up their carpenter's repairs, and quite a lot more. So whatever mission type it is, or what trouble you're having, or what parts of the kit you want to be stronger, these can definitely help with that. Now onto the fun part. Let's get into the strategy tower defense side of the game. Starting with the different roles. There's quite a few, so I'll just skim through. We're given the basic woodcutter and archer. Very straightforward stuff. The woodcutter is melee based and can only hit grounded enemies. And archers are best to hit those flying enemies, but they're quite a lot weaker in comparison. With just these two, we get used to how this whole mix of mechanics works. Like how to place them, what types are best for certain layouts, and how to get the most value out of their job since they won't act outside of their reach. So knowing their range is very important to learn too. And a quick note, everything stops to a complete standstill when you're giving orders. So you'll be able to observe the situation and have that moment to plan out where everyone should go. Now as we defeat major bosses, we'll gain a new mask or role. So there's some classic Mega Man stuff going on. That's how we get ascetic. Within their short range can cast slow on nearby enemies for a brief moment. Take some time to ready up so it's best combined with a barrier or solid frontline. Thief can dig up treasure giving crystals or upgrades, but once it's time to fight, they have no use. Sumo Wrestler, they attack very slowly, but they're more on the tanky side of things to pull aggro, allowing others to attack without much heat. Healer, they um, heal. Short range though, so you need to send those weakened villagers their way. Mid to late game, we get Marksmen and Spearmen. These are the next tier above our starters, having more range and dealing more damage. The trade-off here is a higher cost to use them. But after a while, when you've increased your max amount of crystals, then yeah, these versions completely replace the starters. Okay, Priest can debuff enemies. Cannoneer shoots a cannon. Really slow, but it hits everything for big damage. And lastly, we get Sorcerer and Ninja. These two are the most expensive roles in the entire game, and for good reason. Sorcerers will spend time to do their incantation to summon Shikigami, dealing damage to everything in the arena. And ninjas are just more of you. They can move freely on their own, can attack both floored or flying enemies, and deal decent damage across the board. So there's a wide selection to pick from for all sorts of situations. But there's some limitations and trade-offs to this whole process which makes this entire aspect very engaging. Okay, before we can even assign those roles, we need to find villagers. To do this, we need to explore. Once found, we can give them a role, but to do that, we need crystals, which also needs us to explore. So exploration is a large part of the game, but our only opportunity to do that is during the day. Yeah, there's gonna be a few things going on here. So we're dropped into all sorts of different stage-based missions, each having their own layouts to work with. They all begin during the day, so immediately you should run around for a bit of a scavenger hunt. You wanna look for villagers to purify them, of course, but there's also these defilement for you to purge. This is how we get decent amount of crystals. There'll be a handful of these hidden around the area, so to try to find them, so you can actually give out jobs. And if you find them all, you'll be rewarded with an item. It can be a talisman, skills, and so on. But sometimes they'll be hidden or kept out of reach, so you need to send villagers to repair bridges or remove rubble to open up other areas. Speaking of that, there's also a carpenter to build barriers, platforms, traps, and so much more to help slow down those hordes a bit. Okay, as you're exploring, planning, and getting the lay of the land, you don't have all day to do this. Because if you notice, there's a little timer in the bottom left. Which means during the day, you're quickly trying to get as much done under this certain limit. What makes it better, there's no sprint, so it really puts the intense scramble feel to it all. Pushing you to have better pathing or routing of the map. I really like how they went about that. Well, once the sun sets, it puts a pause on everything. Because now, it's all about fighting off those approaching seas until the night is over. Now to stop this day-night cycle, you need to clear a path for the maiden to get to the end of the map, so she can close her spawn. But to create that path, it costs crystals, the same currency to assign roles. So, as you can tell, there's constant give and take here because of that. You can thoroughly explore to find villagers and give them a role right then and there. But if you're too caught up doing that, it'll eat at your time for the maiden to move at all, or you won't even have enough crystals to make much of a path for her. So prioritizing finding those villagers 
and clearing defilement can make yourself a nice little army. But you'll most likely have to go through an extra night since you didn't let the maiden make much progress during the first day. And that could have been avoided if you just made sure she moved at the start. But the trade off there is having slim to none to spare on villagers, or even lesser versions at that. So you don't want to hard focus on the path or building an army. You want to find that right middle ground of doing both because what you do has some real impact on how things will play out later. As you can tell, there's kind of a lot of moving parts, but it all comes together to create a fun balancing act that starts as soon as the mission begins to the very last second before the sun rises. Now after that's all done, we return to the overworld and we can actually revisit those past areas and that's because they've become a base for us to change our stuff around or level up those roles. And it's not until about 5 hours in did I get the ability to level up our main character. Definitely different, but the entire time had us very familiar to how the game worked, so I get why they did it. But anyways, with the extra skill wheel, that's how we get the perfect guard, counter, the classic ukemi, the bow, and all that good stuff. And from what I can tell, it's not possible to fully upgrade every role in your base game casual playthrough, but don't be too stressed out about it because you can easily respec and level up those new roles to see what they're all about. Now this HQ isn't just a glorified pause menu to prep, because there's a neat little base building aspect attached to it. It's very simple, but you mainly send villagers to build or repair sections of the area. It'll take time, but when they've completed it, you see flowers bloom, animals return to walk around. It reminded me a lot of Okami in that way, seeing the life of the mountain come back and the villages come together, the more effort you put into them. And hey, once you've fully rebuilt everything here, you'll get rewarded with a few goodies. It can be talisman, or it can carry more rations or crystals now. Just some really worthwhile stuff. It actually feels a bit like Act Razor 2 at times. Going from town to town, cleaning it up, taking out waves of enemies, going back to earlier places to check up on them and see how things are going, which also gave you upgrades too, right? Like the new magic attacks. And funny enough, the remake tried this tower defense stuff out too, but if only that game was good. But yeah, either way, everything circles back to each other and it's really worth to interact with these mechanics on some level because of that. When it comes to enemies, there's grunts, the tiny ones don't attack you much at all, but they'll just march as a flood, so don't underestimate them because power in numbers. Blue guys with no arms, they're shooters, so you don't want to leave them be for too long because that chip damage can add up. There's walking bombs that you can probably guess will explode once you get close, but if you can take them out before they detonate, you can swat them away into a large enemy crowd. There's also one that'll stop us from ordering our villagers, one to buff nearby enemies, and one that'll build a ramp so they can completely ignore traps and barriers. Oh now there's one with a bell on their head. It does not take damage from the front, so either slow them down, which is a bit risky since the range is limited, but the reward is definitely there. Or you can set up a sumo wrestler to draw its attention, allowing you or your villagers to hit the weak spot on the back. This guy's a beast, so be sure to get rid of him and fast. Could keep going, but there's a lot of enemies, and that's because the game constantly adds new ones, pretty much with every stage. So they always mix it up and present you some new challenge to overcome. But before we move on, notice how every elite enemy and even bosses have the same yellow meter as we do. That's their resist gauge and the best way to break it is with those cooldown skills or charge attacks. Once done, they'll take even more damage and if you have the upgrade, can land a follow up punishment strike. Okay, to be honest with you, at first, Things are going to be extremely easy. You can just set up a blockade in front of their spawn and just take them out before things even get started. And that's because it's a straight line and one tour gate. But after that very small bit, they start to amp things up. They add more gates for enemies to come out of. Sometimes the path places a gate right next to you, so we're forced in a situation where they'll instantly be on top of us. But we get the occasional fork in the road for us to plan ahead for those sort of things. Not to mention how she's on the move constantly. So you have to rearrange your units in certain areas to cover this or that option because there's more and more paths for the seeds to swarm you. But they also make sure to take this a step further with different formats. It can be a cave which limits our sight but also hides our minimap. You can imagine it'll make things a bit tricky to see those sneaky enemies trying to flank. Or they restrict our movement to thin walkways since we're surrounded by poison. Now we really have to watch our step. Or we'll fight on a boat. Not only are they tiny, but can be broken too. 
losing some precious area to work with. But they also change up the mission type because there's a stage where we don't find a single villager and it's all up to us to deal with every gate and defend every path possible. So this puts a lot of extra responsibility on us. But to help out with that, we get to learn how to use more traps and how they interact with enemies. Or let's flip this and take you out of the equation entirely. So now it's all about your management skills and getting the right people in the right areas. I know I always make this point, but I can't stress enough that this is how action games should be made. Introduce a set of fun mechanics, but let's take things a step further and add variety. Because the X Factor gets us to rethink how to apply them within their limitations. And level design is one of the best ways to do that. But it's also great to have different enemy combinations, map gimmicks, different layouts, and so on, which is what they do here. These things go a long way to keep the game interesting from start to finish, since we're constantly giving you obstacles to overcome. Alright, let me step off my soapbox so we can move on to boss fights. The first few are more like mini bosses, because they'll become regular enemies going forward, but they're great ways to learn how to attack certain enemy types and to get used to setting up your villagers around more demanding enemies. Now the true first boss is this caterpillar. This is a real challenge for your first playthrough I feel, was for me. So here's what you want to do. Do not hang around the maiden. That's step one and we'll find out why in a bit. But the whole gimmick is that we can't see them. So unless you're on the tail or hug the walls, you won't be able to see where they're coming from. To help out with that, you can send some villagers to light those lamps around the arena. And once it's fully lit, You'll expose them and its weak points dealing solid damage. Okay, simple enough, but it fights back. So occasionally it calls for backup, sending out these smaller bugs to try to swarm the maiden. They drop in from all over, so that's why I put ranged villagers on the sides to shoot them down before they even get close. But just in case, I'll have one or two melee based ones nearby as backup. Now here's a real reason why it's a hurdle at the start. And it's because of its unblockable attack. Unless you're close up, you won't be able to see it coming. So if you can, run away a good bit, but you'll need to dodge it in time. It won't stop there because it'll turn around and charge you once more. So just be ready for both attacks and try not to clump up around the maiden because it does damage. Then this dog-like boss, just try your best to avoid standing directly in front of him. Not only is the weak spot their back, but they'll do lunge attacks, toss out slow tracking projectiles that you can hit, but you'll also avoid that charge attack of theirs. There's also this wide flame attack that you definitely want to steer away from the maiden. And like most bosses, they'll spawn in enemies, so have some backup ready for that. Now here's one of my favorite bosses in the entire game. You know how that stage made us tackle it solo? Well, it kept that theme going with this boss fight too. So we get this one-on-one -on -one sword fight where both of us are countering and dodging each other's attacks. For this one, the less I say the better because I want you guys to play it for yourself. This frog will roll around, which gives you a chance to land attacks on their head, which is a weak spot. They also do belly flops a few times, so you better run away from that wave of poison. And use the cannons if you can. Actually, a lot of its attacks leave poison goop behind, so any close-up rolls wouldn't be the best thing. So I just set up marksmen all around the sides to do enough damage during the fight. Then we get this tower, has us do some platforming, having to jump around to find an exposed weak spot in different areas. And while you're on the hunt, you need to check up on the fight below too. And then we basically fight Corrupted Monk from Sekiro. Similar weapons so we get familiar looking attacks. And it's just as fun because another one of those 1v1 fights. Doing counters and watching out for that unblockable attacks of theirs. It's just a non-stop back and forth fight between you two. Definitely another highlight. Near in the end, we fight the spider. This is going to be a cat and mouse sort of fight because they'll keep running away from you, so you need to cut corners and try to close the gap the best you can. When I finally did catch up, I'll try my best to land a skill to stun them. Just be ready to dodge their leap though. Yep, they'll spawn enemies down the middle, so that's why I had my marksmen and ascetics on both sides to keep them busy while I chase the boss or buy me some time to run over there to help out. And of course, some melee based villagers near the maiden is always a safe bet. And you know it's a classic when they have a boss rush at the end before taking down the big bad. You rematch every major boss in one go, but don't worry, you'll be given more rations and some extra crystals along the way. Now as every final boss should, it gave me some trouble. So I had to mix and match a few roles, tried a lot of different formations, and yeah, it was actually pretty fun trying to find my own solution with what I had. I'd recommend you do the same because that's what makes this game so fun. But if you need some idea to mess with, well, this is what I did. 
be sure to fully max out the ninja class. What a surprise coming from me, right? But yeah, get those as well as the aesthetics fully upgraded. Ninjas are fully capable on their own, can dodge, deal solid damage no matter where they are, and their last upgrade lets them escape death. So they'll be able to just rush the boss with not much micromanaging on your end. And for the aesthetics, I place two on each side because, yep, enemies pun here and it will give me or those ninjas time to help out. Now phase two, this time we don't have backup. Here it's all on us, but it's pretty easy. So I'll just start the fight with my favorite high reaching skill. In between any openings, I'd use the powerful single shot arrow to deal decent gauge damage. And for their attacks, there's not too much to look out for. When it crosses its legs, soon as they close in, it'll charge you soon after, which they're punishable afterwards. They might teleport away to send out tracking spikes or the slow tracking ball. I always start on the left side of the arena and from there, hug the wall to avoid it. Now that's good for a few reasons because the boss still attacks you, but since we're on the move, we'll avoid it. And the ball will charge forward before exploding, but again, we have an easier time to dodge it since we're already moving. Whatever you do, you do not want to be near the maiden when it's following you, because it hurts. And that's Kunutsugami, Path of the Goddess. This is a sleeper hit. Yeah, I know it's something very different, and I can imagine the small move list can be off-putting to some, but it can be emphasized enough just how well thought out and engaging it all is. It really reminded me of action games from the 6th generation, how they're very experimental, willing to do something a bit out there. And most importantly, they didn't compromise on their vision. Instead, they really went all in to create unique scenarios around this style of game. Half tower defense and half real-time action. It's not something you see every day, and I'm glad they made sure to get the most out of this premise, because who knows, this just might be a one-off. But that right there is why it'll most likely become a cult classic. It won't be for everyone, but that's what makes it special. And right now, this is my main pick for game of the year. Because it's what a video game should be. It has an interesting concept, they build off it in a few ways, story actually had my attention, surprisingly, and that's because it didn't take gameplay hostage. There's just a lot of good going for this game that I couldn't get enough of. Especially the art direction. A few of my favorite games of all time use this sort of theme. Don't know what you'll call it exactly, but I'm a fan. Yeah, easy to say this is exactly what I've been wanting from Capcom for a long time. And in general, we need more games like this because it really goes to show what gaming has to offer. That's only possible because it wasn't afraid to do something different. So Platinum gave us something very sincere and cozy with Bayonetta Origins, and here comes Capcom doing the same. Hopefully, Team Ninja can join them, but until we find out what they're up to next, I highly recommend you give this a chance. Might not be your usual thing, but as the saying goes, it's worth taking the path that's traveled.